finally, I want to talk about the idea that this hippocampal specialization for pattern separation is not universally beneficial. And this is the key idea behind the complementary learning systems framework. And uh, while it's very useful to keep these pattern, these uh, memory representations separate, to memorize episodic information, things that only happen once that need to be encoded rapidly, it's actually deleterious to do that separation for the rest of the cortex. And in fact, the, the rest of the cortex needs to use overlapping distributed representations with slow learning to be able to integrate information across different experiences. And so we can think about this in the context of two different ways of extracting information and remembering information about parking. So uh, in one case, you want to remember where is your actual car parked today, right? That's the episodic memory, the event-based memory of where is your car. In that case, you need to keep each the memory of each day separate so you don't get this interference. You need to learn rapidly and essentially learn automatically. You may think to yourself when you park your car, oh yeah, I should probably remember where this is. But it would be great if, in fact, you did forget that to do that and you still remembered, right? Um, and then on the other hand, if you want to be able to come up with a good strategy over time for where is a good place to park on a weekend versus a weekday, uh, bad weather, good weather, uh, different times of year, these kinds of things require integrating across many different experiences to extract the overall kind of regularities what is systematic in general, any given day may have some random stuff going on, but if you can integrate across those days, you can come up with what's common, what's good, and applicable across all those different experiences. And that's really what we think the cortex is doing in object recognition and lots of things that it does in language, every other domain is really about learning to extract these general high level semantic kind of category representations and that requires this slower, integrated, distributed kind of learning process. So this suggests that you can't really do both of these in one system. It requires two different sets of parameters, and therefore you want to have a separate brain system like the hippocampus for doing episodic memory and a different, that's distinct from the semantic memory system in the rest of the cortex that is really good at extracting generalities. And this is really the key idea about the complementary learning systems framework. Finally, the last topic is looking at the effects of individual small weight changes in this neocortical generality learning system. Even though we think this is, has a slow, relatively slow learning rate, it still can uh, demonstrate impacts from single trials of learning. And this is kind of the key point of these priming studies. Uh, one version of this is these subliminal messages that we talked about before. Um, and so there's actually uh, uh, two different ways in which this can occur. One is from synaptic changes in weights, and the other is through activation-based residual uh, kind of memory effects. And so these, the model of priming that you can look at in the textbook simulations shows you how that works. Uh, and then finally, as I said uh, previously, chapter 10 will pick up on this kind of short-term memory and show how the prefrontal cortex can maintain information in an active state over time. So that's an important aspect of memory that we talk about in that chapter. Um, and in general, there's a lot more interesting stuff that can be said about memory than we cover in this kind of more hippocampally focused version of, uh, of the memory here. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work on the difference between uh, the familiarity signals, uh, this sort of knowing that you know something but not really being able to fully recall exactly why you know something. Um, that's very important for recognition memory. Um, and also a lot of more recent work trying to understand how the hippocampus contributes to planning, spatial navigation. Uh, it turns out the hippocampus is really the central hub of a network of brain areas called the default network and it's named that because it's kind of where your brain goes to 
when you're not forced to be doing something else outside and you know, paying attention to the outside world. It's kind of the default network of your brain that you return to in the absence of something else. That means that really what we're doing is in our kind of preferred brain state is kind of ruminating and thinking about what uh, kind of events happened in the day, how we might be thinking about what we're planning for the future, um, kind of using our episodic memory and our affective system to think about what's important to us. And so you can kind of subjectively experience that as these kind of daydreaming, ruminating, these kinds of processes are uh, uh, very much involved. The hippocampus and very are very important for synthesizing prior experience and memories in order to prepare us and think about what we want to do next in the future. So memory plays a really critical synthetic role in a lot of aspects of cognition.